A quick word on this week's sponsor Raycon. Raycon is on a mission to prove that you shouldn't have to pay an arm and a leg for quality sound and essential smart tech listening features. Usually, when talking of affordable tech, you get what you pay for, but while trialling their everyday earbuds model, I was really impressed with their crystal clear sound quality, noise isolation while out and about, and the earbud tap functions for receiving calls and allowing me to switch between three different audio profiles on the move. I've been using the everyday earbuds while walking, listening to my favourite history podcasts. The 8 hours of playtime is much better than my previous earbuds. Raycon doesn't outsource the design and development of their earbuds. You can even get a pair and a spare, and still pay less than you would with some of the big name tech brands out there. You can pick from a variety of colours. If you're not looking to spend big on your first pair of earbuds, Raycon is definitely for you. With the Raycon Everyday Earbuds, you get one pair and five pairs of silicon gel tips, a charging case for on-the-go charging, and a charging cable. Support the operations room by using my link in the description and pinned comment below for 15% off your first order, with free domestic or flat fee international shipping, brought to you by Raycon. After the success of Operation Viking Hammer and the clearing out of the Ansar al-Islam group from northern Iraq, the coalition-backed Kurdish Peshmerga will turn their attention to the heartlands of Saddam Hussein's regime. The US Special Forces and Peshmerga militia are redeployed to attack the Green Line, an artificial boundary in northern Iraq which separates Saddam's Ba'athist areas of control from the Kurdistan region. Coalition forces are reinforced by 1,000 paratroopers from the 173rd Airborne Brigade, delivered into northern Iraq in a combat jump into friendly held territory on the 26th of March. Despite heavy defeats in the south, Saddam has deployed a significant part of his army on the Green Line to prevent a Kurdish attack. 150,000 men in 12 divisions of the Iraqi army defend the city of Mosul and Iraq's second largest oil field in Kirkuk. Arrayed against them are 60,000 Peshmerga and 3,000 US Special Forces operators. The main assault on the Green Line begins on the 30th of March against the town of Erbil, which is captured two days later. The Iraqi forces holding the north quickly begin to disintegrate under withering air and ground assault, with many units throwing down their arms. However, the Iraqi 1st Mechanized Division decides to make a stand at the Debeka Pass crossroads, which controls the main roads connecting Mosul, Erbil, and Kirkuk. Iraqi tanks and infantry have entrenched on the Zurkar Zerar Dag Ridge, overlooking the crossroads, which the Americans refer to as Dog Ridge. Capturing the ridge and the Debeka Pass crossroads will impede Iraqi movement on Highway 2 and provide a springboard for an advance into the Kirkuk oil fields. Codenamed Operation Northern Safari, the Peshmerga and Special Forces plan to attack the Iraqi positions with overwhelming force. On the night of the 5th of April, a small group of eight Green Berets go forward in three ground mobility vehicles or GMVs, light air deliverable variants of the Humvee intended for Special Forces use. The three vehicles stop short of the ridge to avoid being spotted by Iraqi defenders, and the Special Tactics Squadron Controller, Staff Sergeant Salim Ali, gets to work. Using a laser rangefinder, Ali marks the targets and uploads individual target data for a precision airstrike. This is a painstaking process which will take hours to complete. Shortly before daybreak on the 6th of April, two B-1B Lancer strategic bombers arrive on station with 24 2,000-pound JDAMs each. Staff Sergeant Ali has spent the entire night programming target data for every single JDAM and hasn't slept in over 24 hours, but his contribution proves critical. At just after 5am, the two Lancers make their first attack run on the ridgeline. One of the Green Berets on station, Sergeant First Class Frank Antonori, later wrote, It was beautiful, the flashes and clouds of smoke and dust erupting into the air as the impacts rolled down the ridge. The Coalition forces now prepare for the main assault. Operation Northern Safari calls for four groups to assault the ridgeline simultaneously. To the southeast, Green Berets and 150 Peshmerga fighters will attack Objective Rock, a T-intersection leading to the crossroads. In the centre, two groups of 250 Peshmerga each will act as the main effort and head straight for the ridge to push the Iraqi defenders off the high ground. Finally, in the northwest, 150 Peshmerga supported by further Green Berets are to capture a dominating hill codenamed Objective Stone. The attack is scheduled to go off at 6am local time. 20 minutes before, the B-1Bs return to hit suspected enemy armour behind the ridge. 
This bombing raid also acts as the signal to assemble for the attack. However, when 6am rolls around, the Peshmerga are not yet in position. It will take another 45 minutes until every column is ready to step off. Finally, at 6.45am, the attack begins. The Green Berets accompanying the southern column advance up the road towards Objective Rock in 8 GMVs while the Peshmerga fan out on either side. Although this would ordinarily be a risky strategy because a single enemy tank could block the way forward, the Green Berets believe following the road will reduce the likelihood of friendly fire and keep the Peshmerga headed in the right direction. The Peshmerga are acting as the main assault force, while the Green Berets will hang back to provide fire support. However, the pre-planned airstrikes have all but cleared the ridgeline of most Iraqi defenders. The attackers cautiously move up the slope, careful to watch for landmines, but the enemy is nowhere to be seen. Sergeant Antonori recalled, Although everybody was anxious to do some shooting, there was nothing to shoot. Instead, the Green Berets and Peshmerga navigate around a 12-foot high sand berm littered with anti-tank mines, which had been built by Iraqi engineers in order to slow their advance. The coalition forces begin to clear the mines when the few remaining Iraqi defenders finally take a few pot shots at the attackers. The response is swift. It takes just two bursts from one of the GMV's 50 caliber machine guns to persuade the Iraqis to throw down their arms and surrender. The Peshmerga and Green Berets push on to Objective Rock and seize the critical T intersection. To the north, the central columns of 500 Peshmerga have secured their objectives without loss. However, dug in Iraqi defenders put up stiff resistance at Objective Stone, taking advantage of their elevated position. Furthermore, the airstrike here has not been as effective, leaving most Iraqi defences intact. The Green Berets attempt to support with their Mark 19 grenade launchers, M2 50 caliber machine guns and Javelin anti-tank missiles, but the Iraqis make good use of their position and succeed in driving off the first attack with the help of heavy machine guns and 120mm mortars. 152mm howitzers also bracket the attackers, forcing them all the way back to their start line. The coalition forces take no casualties, but the Peshmerga request close air support. The Special Forces Commander, Major Eric Howard, calls in an airstrike by B-52 Stratofortresses and asks for additional F-A-18 Hornets to stay on station. The B-52s arrive and saturate Objective Stone with 27 1,000 pound bombs in an awe-inspiring demonstration of air power. The Peshmerga and Green Berets cheer as the hilltop explodes in a cloud of dirt. The F-A-18 Hornets are then called in to conduct precision strikes, dropping even more JDAMs on targets identified during the first ground attack. Following the departure of his air support, Howard orders another assault. The Peshmerga move in, and this time the Green Berets move in closer behind, to better provide support with their 50 caliber machine guns, Mark 19s and Javelin missiles. This display of firepower causes the Iraqi defence to falter as the coalition forces breach their lines on the hillside. After a sharp firefight, the Iraqis on Objective Stone surrender to the Peshmerga. All four objectives have been reached and cleared by the end of the morning. To the south, at Objective Rock, the Green Berets learn from a captured Iraqi colonel that an Iraqi mechanised company is in the area. Because the coalition forces here lack any armoured support, this is a serious threat. The danger is compounded by the realisation that Objective Rock is located in a small depression, meaning any counter-attack will only be spotted from the ground once the enemy is within 200 metres of the position. The Green Beret commander here, Captain Eric Wright, confers with Sergeant First Class Thomas Sandoval and decides to seize the initiative. The eight GMVs move out again to pursue the Iraqis all the way back to the Debecca crossroads. The Special Forces are essentially flying blind as they drive into the morning fog, having also lost radio communications with Major Howard due to the rugged terrain blocking the signal. The GMVs crest the small ridge about 2,000 metres from the crossroads and four Green Berets dismount to go forward and assess the enemy defences. When they reach their recon position, they spot dozens of vehicles passing through the Debecca crossroads. Many are civilians travelling between Mosul and Kirkuk, but Iraqi troop transports, resupply trucks, command vehicles and technicals are also transiting the intersection. 
AT Peshmerga fighters loaded in two pickup trucks and two cargo trucks, and the 25 Green Berets, mounted in eight GMVs, move forward to secure the objective. A single Iraqi military SUV drives towards the column, forcing it to stop. One of the Green Berets sprays the SUV with 50 caliber machine gun fire, riddling the vehicle with rounds and forcing it off the road. The Peshmerga cheer and move to claim the enemy vehicle as a prize, passing multiple civilian cars. Suddenly, a military truck loaded with Iraqi infantrymen is spotted leaving the town of Debeka, attempting to head south away from the advancing coalition forces. The vehicle is too far away to engage with the 50 caliber machine gun or the Mark 19s, but senior weapons sergeant Jason Brown decides to destroy it with a javelin. With the rest of the Green Berets recording the moment with their Kodak cameras, Brown launches the javelin, which arches through the air towards the Iraqi truck. The missile chases the truck for over two miles before finding its target. After a few minutes, the Peshmerga and Green Berets remount their vehicles and drive towards the intersection. Leaving two GMVs behind as overwatch, the coalition moves forward to shut down the highway. Somehow, the Iraqi civilians and military personnel at the intersection seem to have no idea there is a convoy of vehicles approaching from the northeast. At 9.30am, the column reaches the crossroads and the force dismounts to form a perimeter. A motorcycle driven by an Iraqi soldier attempts to run the gauntlet, but is gunned down by the Peshmerga. Seconds later, a pickup truck charges the intersection at 50 miles per hour despite several warning shots. The weapons free order goes out and the truck is immediately hit by small arms fire and four rounds from the Mark 19. Soon after, a bus full of Iraqi soldiers approaches and the men inside begin firing out of the bus windows. In response, all six of the GMVs open fire with their 50 caliber machine guns, shredding the bus. However, the driver brakes hard and executes a perfect three point turn in the middle of the highway before fleeing back towards Debeka stunning the Green Berets, who were also impressed by the driver's skill. At 10am, Iraqi mortar teams near Debeka begin hitting the intersection. Because the area here is barren of cover, Captain Matt Saunders takes four GMVs and races off to engage the mortar team, leaving the rest of the men behind. Seconds later, several shells airburst above the crossroads, forcing the defenders to take cover. They are coming under fire from an Iraqi ZSU-57 anti-aircraft gun, which is covering the advance of a massive problem. A Green Beret shouts, tanks, 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 and points down the road to the southwest. Eight Iraqi MTLB armoured personnel carriers are heading right for the Debeka crossroads, deployed in line abreast. The four GMVs, which left to engage the Iraqi mortar teams, are recalled, and the defenders at the intersection open fire with everything at their disposal. Their small arms and Mark 19s cannot penetrate the Iraqi MTLBs, but they can slow them down and reduce their visibility. The Iraqis deploy a smokescreen from their APCs, making it more difficult for the coalition forces to see what is going on. Shortly after, the Iraqi APCs come to a halt, leading some of the Green Berets to believe they have halted the enemy attack. Instead, they stop and move out of the way for five T-55 main battle tanks. This is a serious enemy counterattack. Sergeant Sandoval immediately recognises the Peshmerga and Green Berets have no hope of stopping this attack in such an exposed position and orders a phased withdrawal. The Peshmerga load up first into their trucks and head back towards Objective Rock while the Green Berets continue to fire back. Several Green Berets attempt to bring their javelins online but the missile launcher's command launch unit computer needs time to warm up, and the Iraqi tanks are advancing fast. The T-55 stop around 900 meters from the intersection and shell their position. Although the T-55 is obsolete and fire is inaccurate, its 100mm main gun still poses a major threat to infantry. Finally, Sandoval orders the rest of the Green Berets to retreat without firing off their javelins. The missile launchers are taking too long. The GMV gunners continue to fire while the rest of the Green Berets load up and begin the trek back up the ridge in search of cover. Staff Sergeant Jake Chandler tunes his radio to the emergency close air support channel. Flash flash, troops in contact, troops in contact, clear the net. This is Roughneck 9-1 with an immediate close air support request, over. Realising that his men don't have the firepower to knock out the enemy armour, 
Major Howard orders the forward units to fall back to the Alamo, a small hill to the rear of their current positions. The Alamo refers to an emergency position where outnumbered American forces can stand and fight to buy time. The GMVs stop and establish a linear defence on the Alamo position, while Staff Sergeant Chandler pleads for air support on the radio. We're taking fire from a bunch of tanks just a couple of hundred metres to our front. What's the ETA for the fighters? The close air support controller responds, Roger, we copy all, ETA 30 minutes. Incredulous, Chandler shouts back, 30 minutes, we won't be here in 30 minutes, we need fighters now. The outnumbered and outgunned Green Berets are on their own for the time being. The Iraqi armour approaches the crossroads, while the Green Berets open fire with everything they have. The 50 calibre machine guns and Mark 19s sweep the valley downrange, but Iraqi mortar fire continues to bracket their position, forcing the Green Berets to constantly move around to avoid casualties. Luckily, the javelins are finally ready to use. Weapons Sergeant Brown launches the first missile at an MTLB on the extreme left of the Iraqi formation. It smashes into the MTLB outside the rated maximum engagement distance for the weapon. The APC explodes in a fireball. Seconds later, a second MTLB also explodes from another shot. A third javelin then catches a third MTLB, another successful kill. In one of the first mass uses of the javelin, it is proving to be a truly devastating weapon. However, the T-55 tanks are using a sand berm in front of them to shield their heat signatures from the javelin crew, meaning they cannot yet be engaged. The Iraqi attack pauses, and the remaining MTLBs dismount their infantry and begin to drive around in unpredictable circles. This tactic might work against the standard tow or Dragon anti-tank missiles, but is useless against the Javelin. The Iraqi infantry attempt to cross an open wheat field, but are quickly engaged by the 50 calibre machine guns and Mark 19s. While the infantry are being mown down, another volley of Javelins is launched. This time, the Green Berets target both the MTLBs and several trucks carrying more infantry. Two MTLBs go up in flames, along with two trucks, devastating the enemy attack. Surviving infantry retreat to the sand berm and shelter with the T-55s, while another two pickup trucks are destroyed by machine gun fire. Although the Green Berets have slowed the Iraqi attack, the intense combat is taking its toll. Almost all javelins have been fired, and spare missiles are too far away from the line to be brought forward. The T-55s allow the Green Berets no rest, popping out from the sand berm to shell their position and then retreating back into cover before the javelins can attain lock. Faced with a dwindling supply of javelins and less than 50% ammunition remaining, Howard knows that they won't be able to hold the position unless he receives air support. After a slight lull in the battle, Iraqi artillery begins dropping smoke on the Alamo position. Knowing this is a precursor to a larger attack, Major Howard orders the Green Berets to pull back to a more defendable ridgeline the Americans will nickname Press Hill. A growing number of media and journalists who have been tasked with covering the battle are accumulating on the hill, leading to its name. Peshmerga forces are also defending this new line. T-55 tanks begin to engage the new defences on Press Hill. Finally, two US Navy F-14 Tomcats arrive on station and are cleared to attack the Iraqi tanks. The tactical air controller on station, Todd Gannon, relays the instructions. We have enemy T-55 tanks near a road intersection, 900 meters from our position, many dismounted infantry near the tanks, and a few trucks also in the vicinity. The F-14s descend below the clouds to get a good look at the battle, and the pilots confirm Gannon's instructions. The Tomcats bank away, and prepare to turn back towards the crossroads for their attack runs. However, with knocked out Iraqi tanks littering the whole area, one of the Tomcat crews misidentifies the location of the Iraqi forces. On the ground, BBC reporter Tom Giles, who is embedded with coalition forces, receives a phone call from his mother wishing him a happy birthday. Having forgotten that today was in fact his birthday, he holds up the phone to capture the sounds of battle and says, Mum, you can just hear, this is the sound of freedom. At this exact moment, his mother in the UK listens to the sound of an American Paveway 2 laser-guided bomb falling and exploding on friendly forces at Press Hill, just 12 yards away from her son. 
The Green Berets at the Alamo position are expecting to see the tanks in front of them erupt in flames, only for a massive explosion to come from their rear. Gannon, the air controller, screams into the radio, Cease fire, cease fire, friendlies hit, abort, 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 blue on blue, blue on blue. Yet the damage is done. 18 Peshmerga fighters and 4 Green Berets are killed, and more than 80 are wounded, including Major Howard. BBC reporters John Simpson and Tom Giles are hit but survive, but BBC translator Cameron Mohammed is killed. This is the deadliest friendly fire incident of the entire invasion. The rest of the Green Berets in the Alamo fall back to Press Hill. Once they arrive at their new position, the Iraqis launch a second attack with armour and infantry, but this is far less coherent than the first. The T-55s remain in place, while MTLBs, trucks and infantry stream past them into the open. An Iraqi MTLB is also spotted driving in a circle, leading Sergeant Antonori to line up the shot. The open ground downrange is now covered by four 50 caliber machine guns, which rip through the ranks of advancing Iraqi soldiers. Meanwhile, Weapons Sergeant Brown targets an enemy truck and fires off the Javelin missile. After 15 seconds, the missile punches right through the truck's skin and destroys the vehicle. Sergeant Jason Brown has just become the first ever Javelin ace, with three MTLBs and two trucks destroyed. However, the air controllers are fighting their own battle with the Navy pilots above. The F-14s return to drop dumb bombs on the enemy tanks, but the pilots are understandably skittish after the friendly fire incident. They drop their munitions far too late and miss the targets. A pair of F-A-18 Hornets now arrive with Paveway laser-guided bombs, but the sand burn continues to protect the Iraqi tanks. The laser designators cannot see the T-55s, leading the Hornets to drop their paveways only to have them explode harmlessly in the sand. Staff Sergeant Chandler calls for the next airstrike to use cluster munitions, but it will be some time before they arrive. One of the T-55s foolishly breaks cover and attempts to fire at Press Hill, but a Javelin missile quickly punishes this mistake. With this, the Iraqis suddenly stop firing, leading the Green Berets to believe the Iraqi commander was in the knocked out tank. Fifteen Iraqi soldiers begin walking towards the ridgeline, waving white pieces of paper to surrender. The Green Berets and Peshmerga hold their fire and motion the Iraqis to keep moving forward. However, two white SUVs appear and drive in front of the surrendering men. A man jumps out of one of the SUVs and shoots one of the soldiers in the head, followed by the rest of the men. These are Saddam Fedayeen fighters who have taken it upon themselves to murder anyone who surrenders to the coalition. Furious at this flagrant crime, the Green Berets call for an airstrike on the SUVs before they can escape. Using the laser designator, an F-A-18 makes an attack run and drops its paveway right on target, leaving no one alive at the scene of the massacre. As the day drags on into the afternoon, the Iraqis launch one final attack but it is the weakest yet. Despite the presence of Iraqi artillery, the Green Berets and Peshmerga successfully break up the attack with heavy machine guns and mortars before it can gain momentum. An orbiting B-52 Stratofortress reports seeing T-55s approaching up the road and drops a 2,000-pound JDAM, but no vehicles are hit. The battle has simmered down as both sides settle in for the evening. More F-A-18s arrive and harass the remaining T-55s, eventually destroying them one by one. By nightfall, the Iraqis have pulled back after suffering staggering losses. In the battle for the Debeka crossroads, 26 Green Berets and roughly 80 Kurdish Peshmerga fighters have faced an entire mechanised company of 5 tanks, 8 MTLBs, 11 troop transports or trucks, and over 150 infantry. By the end of the battle, all 5 T-55s, 7 of the 8 MTLBs, along with 8 trucks have been destroyed, and over 90 Iraqi soldiers have been killed. 18 Peshmerga fighters, 4 Green Berets and a BBC translator are killed, and more than 80 are wounded, almost all of them hit in the friendly fire incident. The Peshmerga will recapture the Debeka crossroads the following day, officially breaking the Green Line. Three Green Berets are awarded the Silver Star for heroism during the battle. By the 9th of April, the Iraqi army in the north has completely fallen apart, and Mosul is taken on the 11th of April. Despite the lack of significant American ground troop presence, the Northern Front of Operation Iraqi Freedom 
proves to be one of the most successful unconventional campaigns in modern military history. A small group of American special forces, along with untrained militia, have routed the Ansar al-Islam militants and the Iraqi army's northern divisions in just two weeks. Ultimately, Operation Viking Hammer and the offensive on the Green Line demonstrates the skill and bravery of the Kurdish Peshmerga. Mark Giaconia will later state, I learned a lesson, the Kurds were smarter than us, and we learned to accept that fact and leverage it. We were not experts in war, they were. In fact, I felt like an idiot when it came to war, compared to the Peshmerga. Thanks again to our amazing Patreons who make series like this possible. Welcome to all our new patrons this month, and a special thanks to our Patron of the Week, Phil McCaffrey. Each week we select our favourite Patreon reactions to shout out. This week, JM says, The Blue on Blue incident is infuriating. And Marcus Parizzo says, The reputation and respect that the Peshmerga earned during Operation Iraqi Freedom among all coalition forces can't be understated. If you'd like to join our Patreon and get access to exclusive benefits such as early access to videos ad and sponsor free, we would love to have you as part of our community.